had gone to bed uh, maybe one hour before I got a call from a producer at WNBC who said that a ship had grounded off a of far rockaway and I needed to head out there. I'll never forget that uh, I saw what looked like a corral of Chinese people surrounded by almost all white people and uh, except for a couple of Asian Americans and when I walked up everyone did this looked down at my chest because I had a press pass on so they were making sure that I had not escaped from the corral One of the things that's really interesting looking back sort of from a historical perspective on the Golden Venture and what happened to the migrants who were on the ship is the immigration policies that um, took place with them. Before 1993 and during the time was the idea of this catch and release policy so that individuals who were seeking asylum and were apprehended would be caught, briefly detained, and then released with a notice to appear or a hearing date set out for them to come to immigration court to actually um, make their case for asylum in the United States. Um, however, with the Golden Venture, was the, what happened was the fact that um, the majority of the passengers are men and these men were actually detained, some for a, a very long period of time, we're talking about three and a half years or more. It wasn't required by law for anyone to be detained while they sought detention. That was actually the um, exception, not the rule. I think that when the Golden Venture happened, you have to sort of look a bit, of, you know, step back a bit at the larger um, social context policies in the United States at the time. This was the early 1990s. We were coming out of the war on drugs, really the war on the poor. 1992 were the LA riots. There were heightened racial tensions. At the same time, there were a lot of migrants coming from Central America in part because of U.S. intervention there, also from Haiti. Um, the Haitians who were coming, they were also coming by boats, smaller boats, and many of whom were um, intercepted by the Coast Guard or other U.S. authorities were taken to Guantanamo where they were detained sort of privately. It was hidden, right, because Guantanamo wasn't part, it's not part of the mainland U.S., so people didn't really see what was happening. Um, and then we arrive in 1993 and there's this boat that, you know, crashes near the Rockaways um, carrying hundreds of migrants from Asia, from China, um, and it was very public. And the government and Clinton sort of, I think, didn't know what to do with them. We went into the hearings to um, handle these cases after meeting with the detainees in the prison and learning their stories and getting, in many cases, documentation about um, their situation and why they had fled China. but. As in the summer of 1993, as these hearings began to t take place, and they took place on an expedited basis, uh, we were trying to represent these people as well as we could. We'd ask for a stay of the hearing or a delay, all denied. Uh, there were good cases and bad cases, but every single one of them was denied uh, by the immigration judges who had been moved into town temporarily to expedite the cases. And before the hearing ever happened, the judges had their minds made up that these people were going back to China. And you hear these hor horrific stories about what would happen if they went back, why they were here in the first place. And I got so angry, I just got furious that we, they would be treated like this in our country. When the Golden Venture um, ran aground at the Rockaways, um, for some people, um, it, especially politically, um, it woke up uh, the media, it woke up um, individuals in, con uh, in conservative groups to demonstrate quite negatively uh, that individuals were coming in mass um, into the United States without inspection um, and uh, effectively pervading uh, you know, the United States. Some of the media was making it sound like there, were the, there was the yellow horde coming, <laughs> thousands and thousands of Chinese are coming over from China, taking over. It happened during a Democratic president, during the early part of his administration, uh, we're speaking about President Clinton, where he felt as a result uh, of his newly inauguration, felt compelled to act. And as a result, 
you see a fundamental change from what we see in 1986, which was sort of a more welcoming policy, to the beginnings of what would eventually happen in 1996, um, where we really haven't shaken the idea of uh, immigration detention and sort of this idea of uh, you are guilty before uh, you know proving to us that you are actually able to produce, able to provide in the United States. So I think it's sort of the beginning and the golden venture was sort of the uh, climax of uh, the detention policies that we see currently today in the United States. I'm thinking it was maybe six or nine months after they were incarcerated that they started making simple pieces, simple folded paper pieces. They didn't have any glue, they didn't have any markers, they didn't have any toilet paper, which became kind of integral in their later artwork. So they were very simple pieces made of just folded paper, but they'd fall apart because there was nothing holding them together. Um, and they gave these as gifts to people who were trying to help them. And the artwork was just phenomenal. And I, I got to go back in the prison and see them, and they had little like factories where some of the guys who were not so artistic would fold the the paper triangles for the others to incorporate in their sculptures. The, the guys in the prison were divided into uh, six different pods and they were A through F and it was almost like the pods had a competition going between them who can develop something like new and original and it was really cool to see that and it was a friendly competition. Yeah, everybody worked together, it was amazing. And so there was a number of articles on the men in the prison and the work that they did and then they began their artwork, which sort of came, which came out as a thank you for helping us because we don't have any way of paying you, and became a culture speaks through art. And the art became very appealing. And it became a desirable thing for people to have and a story to learn and to people know that the men in the prison were incredibly talented and incredibly gifted. And through their art, they told their story, you know, the set me free. And meanwhile, while we were taking our show on the road, we went to New York, uh, D.C., New Orleans, Baton Rouge, where other places where they were being held, and uh, held marches and did everything we could to raise the consciousness of people about what was happening. The Golden Venture happened in 1993, and I believe the last um, migrants were released in 1997. So that's, you know, about four years later. And during that period of time, you know, it was not the policy of the INS to detain asylum seekers. That was not the law. Um, but what we saw was that in 1996, the then President Clinton passed two immigration reform acts um, that are generally called the immigration reforms of 96. Um, that not only sort of expanded the grounds to try to deport um, non-citizens and strip other non-citizens of their right to fight against deportation, but it also created um, these new requirements of mandatory detention where certain individuals had to be detained while they, fight it, while they fought their deportation cases. And it created more bars as well and more obstacles for individuals seeking asylum. And so while the laws were changing, these individuals were detained in New York and so sort of from one day to the next the rights that they had and um, even maybe their paths to fight against deportation changed. In general that act had significant ramifications for pretty much all areas of immigration everything from asylum seekers to people who are undocumented to um, then leading to the passage of more and more laws following in um, after 9-11, right? You have the idea of Homeland Security, the Patriot Act, the Real ID Act. We sort of see 1996 and that act as the precursor for really tightening immigration and in terms of asylum seekers for really tightening and putting much more restrictions in place on those who are seeking safety in the United States as well as other types of immigration benefits in the United States. And since September 11th, since, since the um, passage of the Homeland Security Act in 2002, 
Um, we've seen other policy shifts as well. So we saw after September 11th, around the time of the Homeland Security Act, we saw um, a lot of policies aimed, aimed at targeting Muslim communities. They, just, they, they stemmed from anti-Muslim, anti-Arab, anti-South Asian sentiment. And we saw programs put in place that reflected these policies um, that linked the idea that individuals from these communities uh, you know, were related to terrorism or that posed a threat to our national security. So there was a program called NSEERS, which was also known as Special Registration, where um, men of a certain age from 25 countries had to report to the Department of Homeland Security, many of whom, thousands of whom ended up being deported. And um, 24 out of the 25 countries were predominantly Arab, Muslim, and South Asian. And actually, the 25th country was North Korea. A lot of things are actually done in the name of Homeland Security, which uh, result in things like detention um, or individuals being turned away at the border, even though they have a well-founded fear and a credible claim for an asylum um, application, and they're turned away. Or individuals who, at the sole discretion of uh, particular agencies, uh, effectively are restricting access for them to come into the United States. So the idea of the Agency of Homeland Security is the Department of Homeland Security, which was effectively created after the um, enactment of the 2002 Homeland Security Act. And you have it subdivided into a lot of different agencies. Um, the three that are most um, important, we think, for immigration, and the ones that we see most often are Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, as they're typically referred to, which has um, a bunch of different functions. Some in immigration court, they act as the trial attorneys or the prosecutor, the opposing counsel in the civil immigration removal proceedings. They also act as the enforcement arm um, or as the quote unquote police of immigration. You have also Customs and Border Protection or CBP. Again, those are the individuals, the men and women who would be at our airports, who would or who are at the southern and northern borders of the United States, ports of entry, uh, people controlling quote unquote our borders. And finally, you have USCIS, or the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, and they are the benefits arm of immigration. So those are the men and women who adjudicate things like um, a card, a green card application, or lawful permanent residence, also asylum applications, naturalization or citizenship applications. The Department of Homeland Security that was created, the mission is to secure the homeland. So it's not only about migration, it's about national security, and it's starting to bring what we're seeing now, we've seen how this really has solidified, the conversation about migration now is so enmeshed with these ideas of public safety and national security, but it wasn't always this way. This really came out of the context of September 11th. So now the Department of Homeland Security is the, is the um, agency that is in charge of, uh, of anything immigration related, but also national security related. There are a lot of individuals that have regular check-ins with ICE. These individuals are on what's called an order of supervision or some type of parole. We're on a regular basis, whether that's every month, every six months, every year, so on and so forth. They go to an ICE office and they check in with an individual, um, basically in order to uh, allow that, that immigrant, that non-U.S. citizen, to stay in the United States. Uh, we're seeing that those check-ins oftentimes have very severe repercussions for that non-U.S. citizen. For example, that person may be arrested, um, irregardless of the fact if he or she committed a crime, but would be arrested and then put in detention by ICE. And I would say that um, as a result of uh, that, um, what you would call, for lack of a better word, hysteria, um, yeah. it caused a lot of communities uh, to effectively prevent uh, crime in their neighborhoods. Uh, people were afraid to report um, you know, violent crimes or issues that happened in their community. People wouldn't go out and get access to benefits uh, because they feared that if they exposed themselves as an undocumented individual applying for their U.S. citizen children, that they would be put into removal proceedings. Cases were effectively dismissed in court uh, because the parties wouldn't show up because they were afraid that ICE uh, would come in um, and uh, effectively remove them from the country. And you had a lot of individuals for uh, either minor crimes uh, that wouldn't be considered a security risk uh, removed from the United States uh, and returned back to their countries of origin. I think what's important to note is that the laws haven't changed. Um, and the last time the immigration laws changed were 20 years ago in 1996. And anyone who's in the United States who's not a US citizen could potentially be vulnerable to deportation. 
And what we're seeing under this current administration is that um, although the laws haven't changed, some of the policies have shifted in terms of who is at risk, who is being targeted for immigration enforcement, for immigration to try to detain and deport from the United States. Um, whereas in the past, we've seen more targeted policies towards certain pockets of non-citizens. Now, under this current administration, anyone who's vulnerable to deportation, which could be someone who's undocumented, it could be someone who is an asylee, a green card holder, uh, someone with a visa, people who've had contact with the criminal justice system. The idea of immigration detention is a direct offshoot of the prison industrial complex is the idea that here in the United States, we as a country have decided for many historical reasons to put a large amount of money into jailing people. Um, and so immigration detention is jail. It is uh, people, whether they be children, whether they be adults, whether they be mothers with children, and by children that can be as little as a five-month-old baby, I think is the youngest that Ernie and I have seen, um, housed in prison-like conditions, wearing jumpsuits and not being able to leave those facilities. For the last uh, almost decade, there has been um, uh, a quota. It's, we, we often refer to it as the bed quota. It's part of an Appropriations Act that requires that on any given night, ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, must have at least 34,000 non-citizens detained in order for them to receive certain amounts of funding. I think it leads to roughly about 400,000 people a year that are, are sleeping in detention facilities. So that's a congressionally mandated quota, which means that you taxpayers out there, you are paying for this which um, means that our immigration detention facilities are throughout the United States. And that also provides an incentive for immigration to continue with their enforcement, with their aggressive enforcement, to be able to meet that quota so that they can receive the money, the billions and billions of dollars that they already have for immigration enforcement, um, to continue sort of with this deportation machine. And actually, it's been a proposal by the current administration to increase the requirement, the, increase the number of, of individuals subject to the quota by 10,000 more. 10,000 more beds, that's 10,000 more individuals, you know, 10,000 more families that, you know, communities that would be impacted by that. In the private um, detention facilities, those are um, you know, run by large corporations. Again, they're for-profit uh, detention centers. And essentially, you know, shareholders in these corporations are making money off of detaining non-citizens and off of this idea that um, because beds need to be filled, uh, you know, people should be locked up, regardless of whether or not this makes sense, taking out all humanity in this question of migration. It becomes all about enforcement and numbers and policing um, and uh, rhetoric about public safety and migration and immigrants being criminal aliens. Whereas 20 years ago, we weren't having these conversations. There wasn't this um, sort of uh, this rhetoric around immigrants being threats to public safety. There were detention facilities that existed, but the numbers of non-citizens who were detained are nowhere near where they are now, and that's because of the laws that have passed that have created this incentive to, this incentive for immigration to detain non-citizens. So immigration detention is simply for people that don't have papers or who have quote unquote problems with their papers or individuals who are considered by statute, and I'll put this in quotes, to be arriving aliens, which means people who are coming to the United States and who are apprehended at the border. And for a lot of the people that Ernie and I have worked with have um, expressed a fear of going back to their home countries. So that while things have changed since um, 1993, that the immigrant experience that these men have endured is still going on right now. And that a lot of what they 
they have suffered of spending three and a half years in detention is sadly what's going on right now. The Golden Venture men and women who are here have been accepted within their communities. They have, many of them, American children. They have American children who have been, who have been successful in their careers in school and done all sorts of great things. So they're a vital and integral part of their communities. Um, they are here on a presidential uh, pardon humanitarian parole visa that basically is at the will of the government to let them stay or not stay. Their hope, just like that of many other undocumented immigrants, is that that comprehensive immigration reform be passed that will grant them permission to stay because they have the records of having been here for years. They've been paying taxes. They have been productive citizens. That's the one hope that they have. The great fear with the mood and atmosphere and the knowledge of who is randomly being picked up and deported at this point in time is, and I know it is their fear, they have to report to the Immigration Service, to ICE. They could, at any point, be deported. That's the fear. But the dream